Episode three, The Hate Begins. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once, long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The programs of the Two Minutes Hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other, he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies, perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters. Perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumored, in some hiding place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureola of white hair and a small goatee beard, a clever face and yet somehow inherently despicable, with a kind of senile silliness in the long, thin nose, near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep, and the voice, too, had a sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party, an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarming feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken in by it. He was abusing Big Brother. He was denouncing the dictatorship of the party. He was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia. He was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. He was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed, and all this in rapid polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained new speak words. More new speak words, indeed, than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army, row after row of solid-looking men with expressionless Asiatic faces, who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished, to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull, rhythmic tramp of the soldier's boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleating voice. Before the hate had proceeded for 30 seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, the sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia, since when Oceania was at war with one of these powers, it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange 
was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day on platforms, on the telescreen, in newspapers, in books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish that they were, in spite of all this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was the commander of a vast shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as the book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumors. Neither the Brotherhood nor the book was a subject that any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the tops of their voices in an effort to drown the maddening, bleating voice that came from the screen. The little sandy-haired woman had turned bright pink and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. He was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling and quivering as though he were standing up to the assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had begun crying out, Swine! 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 And suddenly she picked up a heavy new speak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. The horrible thing about the two minutes hate was not that one was obliged to act apart, but on the contrary, that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within 30 seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one, even against one's will, into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet, the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blowtorch. Thus, at one moment, Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but on the contrary, against Big Brother, the party, and the thought police. And at such moments, his heart went out to the lonely, derided heretic on the screen, sole guardian of the truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet the very next instant, he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein seemed to him to be true. At those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration. And Big Brother seemed to tower up, an invincible, fearless protector, standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia. And Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that hung about his very existence, seemed like some sinister enchanter capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. It was even possible, at moments, to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort with which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, Winston succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. Vivid, 
Beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like Saint Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her and would never do so, because round her sweet, supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with your arm, there was only the odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol of chastity. The hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat. And for an instant, the face changed into that of a sheep. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seemed to spring out of the surface of the screen so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seats. But in the same moment, Drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother, black-haired, mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are uttered in the din of battle not distinguishable individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. Then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead, the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. But the face of Big Brother seemed to persist for several seconds on the screen, as though the impact that it had made on everyone's eyeballs was too vivid to wear off immediately. The little sandy-haired woman had flung herself forward over the back of the chair in front of her. With a tremulous murmur that sounded like my savior, she extended her arms toward the screen. Then she buried her face in her hands. It was apparent that she was uttering a prayer. At this moment, the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of B, 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 over and over again, very slowly, with a long pause between the first B and the second. A heavy, murmurous sound, somehow curiously savage, in the background of which one seemed to hear the stamp of naked feet and the throbbing of tom-toms. For perhaps as much as 30 seconds they kept it up. It was a refrain that was often heard in moments of overwhelming emotion. Partly it was a sort of hymn to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother. But still more, it was an act of self-hypnosis, a deliberate drowning of consciousness by means of rhythmic noise. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cold. In the two minutes hate, he could not help sharing in the general delirium, but this subhuman chanting of B, 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 always filled him with horror. Of course, he chanted with the rest. It was impossible to do otherwise. To dissemble your feelings, to control your face, to do what everyone else was doing was an instinctive reaction. But there was a space of a couple of seconds during which the expression of his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment that the significant thing happened, if indeed it did happen. There'll be more tomorrow.